Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. We'll go ahead and get started in 1 Peter chapter 1, looking at verses 6 through 9 this evening. I will pray and then we'll read through all the first part of the chapter and start going through some of the details. Uh, just kind of building off of last week, we were talking about faith and leading into uh, the, the trials and tests that we face, and it's helping develop our souls and and, re, and and preparing us for our appearing before Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's Peter's telling him, you're going through a process. You're going through a, a, a process that's preparing you for the glory and that will result in praise and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We're going to get a little more details about that this evening as we look at some of the, the things that Peter wrote. Well, I'm going to pray and then we'll get started. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to live in this country, but also to be born again, to have your spirit present in our lives and to have a force of the word of God. We ask that we would take it seriously, that we would take advantage of the opportunities that we have and, and help bring our minds, our souls into a perspective that can analyze the situations we face in life in, in light of, of your divine viewpoint of our eternal destination. And Father, we do thank you again for all that you've done for us. And that's we may be prepared to become the people you've called us to be at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and begin in chapter 1 of, of 1 Peter and read. Oh, let's just go ahead and read down through verse 10 and 11 right in that area. Maybe up to, I'll just go ahead and read up through verse 12, please. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's addressing people that are in God's plan. He addresses that here. Verse 2. Who have been chosen according to God's foreknowledge, or the, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by His blood. You see the Trinity there? You see the three parts of the Trinity place. God's got the plan, Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and we're brought into the covenant established by Jesus. Then He says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And those are Christian greetings. Uh, also tying in with the, both the Gentile and the Hebrew uh, form of greeting with grace and peace. Verse 3. Praise be to God the Father, or say good things, blessed be God the Father, or we're going to say good things to God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because in His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead or out from among the dead. So we're speaking good things to God because He's given us a new birth, a, a regeneration of being born again. Uh, into a living hope. And this living hope is something that it's, it's alive now that's driving us, that's leading us, that's doing something in our lives right now. Again, already Peter's talking about a process that they are in. He says you've been born again and placed into this process, and this process now is developing. So in a sense, you know, salvation is complete, but yet salvation is, we're in a process. You understand what I mean when I say we are in the plan of God, we are children of God, but we're being transformed from mere men, mere earthly fallen beings, into not just good people, but being transformed into the image of the Son of God Himself. I mean, it's it's a long journey from you know. So that's what he said. We've been born again into this process, a living hope that's taking us somewhere. It's going to be, and, and that whole process is kind of what's taking place in their lives. They're facing difficulties, suffering. Well, they're they're changing, they're growing, they're they're in conflict with the world that they're in. Uh, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. There's some great words right there. Uh, we talked about those in detail. That They have an inheritance. That's, that's what they are born into, and they're not going to lose it. It can't fade away. They can't overspend it. They can't lose it. We talked about the military terms, about how it is, is taken care of. It's guarded. And it's kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. Again, their inheritance is kept in heaven, it's guarded, it's, it's in heaven being preserved for them. They can't defile it. And that's one of the words right there. Perish, spoil, or fade. It means defiled. You cannot sin it away. You're in. But not only is the inheritance kept in heaven for them, they themselves are shielded in time now by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is, is ready to be revealed. So there again is another indication. We are in the plan. We are saved. We've got the inheritance. But you now, until you are all brought together to completion, we call it glorification, uh, you're, you're shielded by God's power now in time. So he's telling you, you're going through some tough things, but you're not going to lose your inheritance, and God is with you in this process. He's helping you through these, these trials until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed. Remember the word ready means 
the table, it's the same word used as the table is set. When Jesus talked about uh, the banquet is prepared, the table is set, it's prepared, come. And the same idea, it's ready to be revealed. We're not waiting for anything except for God's purpose to be fulfilled. But it's, it's ready right now. But it's going to be revealed in the last time. In this, and again, that's kind of where we pick up right now. In chat, on a, oh man, I might as well start with the notes. I was going to read to the end, but I'm already teaching. Here we go. Uh, where it says right here, in this you greatly rejoice, and that in this is not referring to being born again, it's not referring to the inheritance, it's referring to the in time, in this, in the idea right here, you can see the first notes, in this is feminine in the Greek, it refers to the feminine word time at the end of verse, uh, verse 5. So in this, right now, in this process, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So here's several things here on some of these words. In this right now, in this idea that now in time with this, this concept right now, you greatly rejoice. Right now you are rejoicing. We talked about that word rejoicing before. It's a word that's not doesn't mean just happy and giggly and, and you have in a good mood. It always has been used with the ideal of some kind of spiritual depth. There's there's a spiritual understanding, meaning you understand what's taking place, and so there's this, this rejoicing and anticipation. It, it refers to something deep in your soul that you anticipate, that you understand. And notice it says right here, it's not a command, but it's a result. Because Peter says, because all these you're in this situation with the new birth and the living hope and you're in this place and time in this you greatly rejoice there's an inner drive and you've all experienced that before you've experienced the new birth you've experienced the presence of the spirit you've experienced that hope and you've also experienced just that inner inner joy i mean there's there's that rejoicing there's something it's a force inside of you that things may get bad and, and you may get depressed or down or something, but there's something in the believer and that is comes from this understanding that where you're at, there's a process, we're going somewhere. In this you greatly rejoice. Um, in verse ch chapter one, verse eight, it indicates that this future joy is inexpressible. So understand that those times where you feel, or I don't want to use the word feel in that mystical, emotional way, but that those times where you experience that rejoicing, that, that something that is deep within you, in chapter 1, verse 8, they'll look at this right here. Go ahead and look at it in verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. In other words, we're going to get to, we're going to building up to that point there too, but understand, what we experience, it's like, it's inexpressible. It's something from another dimension. It's from eternity. It's from heaven. It's from the spiritual dimension. It's not because uh, of anything earthly. It's nothing that, that, that can be changed. It's something that you can't even explain. There's just It's this force. It's spiritual. It's eternal. And so in this, you greatly rejoice. With this understanding comes this internal rejoicing, though now... That, that is what's on the inside. That's where you're heading. You're heading to this eternal place, this time. That's your destination. But now it's, it's contrasted with, but now. The, the time at the end of verse 5 is contrasted with, but now. For a little while, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. And again, we talk about a, a little while. It means a short time. You can see the notes right here. Yeah, right there you can see it. It means a time today. It can refer to two things. It can, our time, our life is short compared to eternity. But also it can be broken down, and it's, you can see this throughout the book of Peter, is the suffering is not a continuous suffering. There's phases of the suffering, or phases of these testing. And it, actually the word here is, is grief that we're going to be talking about here. It, it isn't consistent, I mean, uh, consistent meaning it isn't continual. And it goes on, to, we'll talk about it here in a moment. But it, you, may have, uh, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Notice again where it says, may have had to suffer. That goes along with that little while. Meaning it is not, I think it's somewhere on there towards the, oh, right in the middle of the page. It is not the continual condition. It is not the universal condition. And it is even in a, in a, a phrase in the Greek, in the if, it could be uh, hypothetical. Meaning it may not be the case. Not everybody is suffering in the same way. It is not the normal condition. God did not create people to suffer. Grief, and we're going to talk about that word suffer or grief here in just a moment. But again, that is not the normal state. It is the normal process. You are going to go through periods of suffering, times of suffering, but it is not something that your life has been designed by God to just be a, a series of suffering and grief. But when you do come through these short times or moments, again, sometimes they can be extended very long, it seems like, 
but those are right here. Uh, the, uh, there, there are things that are not necessarily universal, and we know that because different people face different types of trials, tests, tribulations, uh, different types of grief. And that leads us to this word, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. There's a lot of things taking place there. And that word grief, I do want you to look at four verses uh, where it says suffer or suffer grief, or also some translate being fretted, is from the Greek word L-U-P-E-O, L-U-P-E-O, and we see, I've got four verses written down about that, which refers to the emotion of suffering. It's, it's, we'll just write the word emotion. It is not referring necessarily to physical beating. When it talks about they are suffering now, here's three or four times it is used in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 9, uh, the king was distressed. See the word distressed? That's the same word right there. He was distressed. The king was distressed. He, the king was suffering. Uh, but because of his oath and his dinner guest, he ordered that her request be granted. He was distressed because of what he had, he had announced. He, 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 he had, was filled with grief. It was something emotional. He was torn, but he went ahead with it. So that's again, notice he wasn't being persecuted. He wasn't losing finances. Matthew 17, verse 23. They will kill him, uh, Jesus tells his disciples. And on the third day, he'll be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. The only thing Jesus did was tell them a story or tell them a prophecy, tell them what was going to take place. And they were filled with grief. They were filled with suffering. They didn't get hurt. They were still comfortable. If they were eating supper, they were still eating supper. If they were full, they were still full. If they had a good night's sleep, they still had a good night's sleep. But this information caused them to suffer. So again, kind of understand what Peter's talking about right here. He, when he says suffering, you have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. I'm going to give you a list of trials here that we can face, or in the Bible talks about facing. And it's not always persecution. It's not always a satanic attack. It's not always necessarily a loss. It is so, oh, we'll wait and talk about that in just a moment. Uh, Matthew 18, 31, another time. Here's one of Jesus' parables. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged or filled with grief and went and told their master everything that had happened. They said, that's not fair. This, this has to be balanced out, right? This has to be, justice has to be done. They went and reported it. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, a verse we're all familiar with, or all these we are, I guess. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep or have fallen asleep so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. So that's the same word when it says, uh, suffer grief and all kinds of trials. That is what it's talking about. Notice those four examples. There's no one being persecuted. It is just people facing life or facing decisions and just making or making decisions. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, in this, in time right now, with this information, you greatly rejoice, understanding the eternal state of things, though now, in the present temporal world, for a little while, I mean a short time, maybe a phase, maybe compared to eternity, you may have had to suffer, maybe not, but you may have had to suffer grief, and notice the word grief again, that's those, that, that turmoil, so maybe an inner turmoil. You may have had to suffer something uncomfortable, something that you didn't think was just, you don't think it was fair. Maybe it, maybe it results in some kind of physical persecution or social persecution. Maybe it results in some kind of a loss, but it's more of an inner turmoil of this joy that you've got. I'm looking at this great future and the way eternity is going to be, but down here, it's not working out the same way. There, there's things that aren't right. Okay. I uh, have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. Um, let's look at that bottom of the page right there. Oh, I should say something like this too. At the, I'm going to skip that. Uh, where it says at the bottom of the page, it says temptations. It shows you the word that it comes from, perismos. It can refer to trials, testings, and temptations. Uh, and we need to, sometimes we can break these things apart, but sometimes they're all, like Peter is kind of just lumping them all together. It's like, what are we talking about? We're talking about a wide range of things that they're facing, especially when you use this word, and then you say, all kinds of trials. And these right here that Peter's talking about, these come to test the character. The, the, here's what happens, as you know. Trials or tests or grief comes, and different characters, different personalities, different levels of maturity respond a different way. So you can see 
God can see, we can see, what's inside of ourselves on how we handle trials. We can all of a sudden see what is important to us. When, sir, and you can look at it a thousand times in your life. I, I can look at times in my life, if it be recent, if it be through my lifetime, if it be when I was 20s or 30s or 40s or something that happened last week. The way I responded to the situation revealed a lot about my character. It revealed what was important, what I thought was a priority. It, it revealed my faith. Did I have, you know, you talk about having faith in God or Christian faith, but when pressures come, when griefs come, when, when turmoils come, when this isn't fair, this isn't right, do you have faith in people? Do you have faith in, in mankind? Do you have faith in this group of Christians? Or do you have actually have faith in God the Father, in, in faith in the Son of God? Do you have faith in the truth of the Word of God? And these things, are, sometimes as I go back in my life, there's times when things weren't right, and it's like it, the way I reacted indicated, you don't have faith in God, you have faith in these people. Oh, and that, that revealed the genuineness of my faith. You were saying you had faith, or you thought you had faith, and Peter's going to eventually, it's going to show us two things. It's going to show... It's going to do this. It's going to reveal your faith. And when I say faith, I, I, Peter's assuming you've got faith, but sometimes our faith can be undeveloped. You know, it, it's like we, we, we kind of got this broad target. We believe this general thing. Well, when a test comes, it's going to reveal the part of the target you're shooting at, and that, that test is going to do the next thing. It's going to be, it's going to refine it. He's going to say it's refining it like gold. So he's not saying you don't have faith. He's saying your faith, if you allow me to say, you know, I don't want to put words in Peter's mouth, but it's like you've got this general, yes, I'm a Christian. I have faith in God. Okay, but do you have faith in what part of God? Do you know anything about God? You've got to learn some things, and there's certain things that really aren't part of God that you maybe are trusting. And it's going to reveal where your faith is, if it's genuine faith, if it's, if it's faith, maybe it's in mankind or in situations. And then as it's revealed, it's also going to refine it. You're not going to, he's not saying you don't have faith. He's saying your faith is, well, it's going to be compared to gold or silver that has to be passed through the fire and the impurities float up. And if you think about the trials and tests that you've gone through, a lot of times it, it breaks you. you if to continue, you've got to let go of those things that you shouldn't have faith in. Then you're counting on this person. You're counting on this situation. You're counting on these things. And God says, that's not faith in me. That, that's faith in situations. And you either give up or you proceed. Well, we'll talk about this, I think, as we turn the page. Go to the top of the page, too. In Peter, now, again, I, like I said, I'm saying quite a bit here. But Peter is just saying that you've got great joy inside, and he's going to say it's inexpressible based on your eternity, but now in time, that joy is challenged. That rejoicing is undermined because of suffering, grief, disappointments, because of trials. And the trials can be tests, trials, temptations. That's what the word means. And it says of all kinds. There's a wide variety. And here we have a, a list of things these trials on top of page 2 are not identified, nor is their source. So Peter doesn't say what they are or where they come from. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these are things that we're going to say, what kind of trial? That's what I'm trying to say. These are the trials. But Peter just says it's, it's broad. And he doesn't even say where they come from. They're coming from Satan. They're coming from God. They're coming from these people. They're coming from your own sin nature. All that can be part of it. It's, it's fairly wide. Uh, these trials could be, because of this definition that we've seen so far, and I think this is a this is safe target, it's, not, it's very broad, it can refer to social and economic trouble. It can refer to uh, physical persecution. It can refer to personal rivalries. We can, this is when you read in chapter 1 of James, and into chapter 2 of James, he's talking the same, that's why I just skipped one of the verses on page 1, I was going to head over there, but I thought it would take us a while to explain all that. But what you've got there, he's got personalities within the church and they're biting and fighting and devouring each other. And that's the suffering that they're going through. They're destroying their own church because of the suffering that they're bringing in their own, uh, and, and own goals, their own anticipation of events. They're, and they're not following meekly the word of God. Uh, and all of these are coming. 
in the context, the social, the economic trouble, the physical persecution, the personal rivalries, uh, and even this next one. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is one of probably the, one of the big ones that we see in the New Testament. Is It's easy to talk about the suffering of persecution. It's easy to talk about Satan opposing you or, or different things. And that's all within the scripture. But the thing that probably is predominant in the scripture is right here is, is Christian service. Of not only were you born again, sanctified by the Spirit, and now you are in this covenant and Jesus Christ has placed you in the body. He's given you a calling. He's given you an assignment. <clears throat> He's given you some form of Christian service to serve the body, to serve others. And to execute that, that sometimes is really the focus of the suffering. And thus we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So yeah, forget persecution, forget the world, forget all the unjust things. Think about just going from point A to point B in the calling God has given you in your own personal ministry. And it's kind of like, ah, uh, that's too far to go. Well, look at, look at Paul. Paul's talking about that right here. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you know these verses, but they're, they're worth reading. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm looking in verse 23. Now again, you understand the situation. We're, going to be, we're heading to the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians in church, so we'll eventually get to this and we'll have a lot of background on it. But Paul has lost control of the church of Corinth. Uh, they've, gone, they've heard his teaching. They springboarded from his information about being born again, about the Spirit and this new life. They springboarded right from that, right back into Greek philosophy, brought in some some great speakers and orators and great presenters, and, and they kind of combined Greek philosophy and threw out the things that were difficult in Paul's theology, like the resurrection from the dead and, and Jesus Christ's return and, and all these things, and started being, well, it's all right now today. It's, it's today. They started applying right now to their life today. People loved their flocking effort. And Paul said, wait a minute, you've completely rewrote the message. You're, you're, you're going a different direction. He called them false apostles. He also called them super apostles. Um, and so now he's, he's now challenging them. And now what he is describing for himself, or for them, is someone who is indeed serving Christ. Says, this is what he's, what he's doing. He's comparing himself to these super apostles, or these false apostles, who have got everybody's all excited about you know, who's speaking and what's going on. And he says, really, he says, this is what it looks like. If you're going to be fulfilling God's purpose, it's going to look more like this than what those super apostles or those false apostles have. I'm in verse... 23 of chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. And this would be one of the forms of suffering, Christian service. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. And then what he's actually doing, he's actually now stopping. He's okay, I'm going to make comparisons. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods from the Romans. Once I was stoned. That was over in Lystra. Three times, or in that area. Three times I was shipwrecked. Now we know of one. He was shipwrecked at that time that he recorded the book of Acts when he was shipwrecked on his way to uh, Roman prison. There's two other times he was shipwrecked. It's like, would you stop sailing in the winter season, Paul, and just, just wait until the spring comes? But he was shipwrecked three times. That's probably in the Mediterranean Sea. So three different times Paul was floating on a board in the Mediterranean Sea because he was trying to go from point A to point B to take the gospel or to follow up on the churches. <laughs> and he's saying, he said, I've got some commitment here. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. And because of what? Because of his ministry. He's suffering. I have been in danger from rivers. Crossing rivers. Now, again, he had to cross some rivers sometimes, and he, he may die today in the ministry because he's going to go from across this river. Not everybody makes it, but I've got to get, I've got to, get to Galatia, or I've got to get to Ephesus. Uh, I've been in danger from, uh, I lost my place. Okay, in rivers, in danger from bandits. Again, you're traveling those highways. It wasn't like, you know, here, here comes St. Paul, and everybody kind of, you know, stepped back and were awed at him. Bandits were jumping him, trying to take any money. Remember, he's going from from uh, Corinth through Ephesus all the way down to Jerusalem. He's going to take a bag of money, or a huge amount of money that he's collected from all the churches. He's got people traveling with him to protect him because if they if they could jump him and get this this cash, it'd be it'd be a it'd be like a treasure. 
in danger from my own countrymen, that means the Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, that's the heathen, in danger in the city, in danger in them. Remember Ephesus, we just went through chapter 19 of Ephesus. He was danger in the city. Okay, well, why don't you go somewhere safe like the country? I'm in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. That's in the church. He's having trouble with Jews. He's having trouble with the heathen. He, at least he's got the Christian brothers. Eh, don't count on that. Some of them have betrayed him. In danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And here's the thing that gets me. It's one thing to go through all those sufferings, but at the end of the day, he looks back and says, but it's still worth it. I still care about those people. It's like you think of the false brothers, everyone's betraying them all the time. It's like, oh, enough. I give up. I'm not even worried about it. You only have time to think about it. He says, after I've done everything just to stay alive, he says, then I can't sleep because I worry about if I did it right, if I did a good enough job, if, if they're still surviving as a church in Corinth. He wrote them four letters. We've got two of them. How many times? And they kept walking away. He kept writing them until finally he won the church back. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? In other words, who, if I've ministered to these people, if I shared with them the gospel, if I followed up on them as a church, and then I see them falling away, he says, he says, who is weak and I don't feel like it's my loss? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? It's like it's my, my responsibility. He says, if I must go on boasting, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Uh, the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. He goes on and he continues to talk right there. But again, we're looking on back. Well, let's go back to 1 Peter. And so Peter's talk, when he uses this word, to suffer grief in all kinds, he's referring to social economic trouble, potentially. He's referring to physical persecution. He's referring to personal rivalries within people, within the church that they're suffering, that we see in James chapter 1 and 2, and even struggles in the Christian service, meaning every time... Paul or anybody went out to do something, there was opposition or a price to be paid. Now, one thing, probably one of the commentators and, and the Greek scholars were talking about is this probably does not refer to sickness or illness. That's a completely different word, a completely different direction. Again, not that that's not a form of suffering, not that there's trials and testing that, but that was probably not what this was referring to. Okay, and the mixed part about this, we're still in that first verse, the word all kinds, you know, all kinds of trials, meaning, again, a wide variety. The word itself isn't broad enough. Peter adds to it all kinds of the wide variety. And here, these are, these are the different things I wrote down. Trials from forces that want to destroy us. That would be like satanic efforts to destroy us. Tests from God as he proves our faith, things that he allows to come in our path that is testing us, that we've got to make the right decision or to refine us, as Peter's going to say, or temptation from our own sin nature, meaning this includes our own willingness or desire to sin or walk away from the truth or walk in error. And it also refers to the believer's three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. It kind of sums up those, those three things there. So again, all kinds. Again, this is wide variety. And it, Paul, Peter doesn't really identify what or where it's coming from. Kind of leaves it right there. I just try to define that a little bit for you because that's what we're talking now is talking about these griefs, these emotional trials that are wearing at these believers. Uh, and again, they can come in a wide variety. Okay, verse 7. Now he says these trials, these sufferings, these griefs, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's saying these things are right here in time. These trials have come to you now so that this thing that you've got now, your faith, is going to be refined. This faith is worth more than gold. Now again, in, in the eternal scheme of things, the most valuable thing you have, according to this verse, and allow me, you know, make sure you're thinking, but it is not your possessions, although we like possessions. It is not even necessarily relationships you've got with people, although relationships, I think, are eternal in many cases. Um, it is your faith. It's your faith in the eternal God because the, that faith is going to be refined. It's going to be re, re, uh, purified. It's going to be defined. And that is that faith that you take into eternity, not your goal, not your list of friends, not anything that is temporal. Right here, read again. These have come, these trials, 
the good news in it, this does not even make sense. I mean, this is not this doesn't even, this does not preach well because it's like the most valuable thing you've got is your faith, and the best thing for you is to have trials that test your faith, so you purify, you really help folks on what is important, what is really faith in the true God, and what is just peripheral things. Maybe you're trying to please men or things that are distractions. Let those go, and you identify this faith because your faith is going to be the thing that, in the end after it's been refined with fire, and the fire would be just these experiences in life, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. There's your word, dokimazo, proved genuine. And again, we've talked about that word before. It means tested for approval, meaning uh, if it was a word that was used in the medical field. We mentioned this last week. Use the medical field. If someone to go through the school, the medical school, then they'd have the doki mods or the test to see if they really were a doctor, if they were really knowledgeable. You say you're a doctor, you want to be a doctor, well, doki mods, we're going to find out, yes, you are. You pass the test. That your faith may be proved genuine. Again, you can say a lot of things. You can say you've got faith, but if you really have faith, you'll make it through these things. And if you don't make it through these things, those things are going to make you rethink. You're going to, have to go back and take some classes again. You're going to go back and reevaluate some things. But you will come over here and you will have gold or faith in the end. Meaning you are going to pass. You are going to be, in this case, uh, the medical doctor. It's just you're not that yet, so we're going to come back over here. What you presented on the exam, wrong answer. Come back and we go through some trials. We have you reevaluate. We're going to take some classes again. Now, doki mods on another trial. Congratulations, you move on. And that is what the process, and what's going to happen right here, it tells you, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, even, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved, may be doki mod genuine, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, the concept here is, and again, I'm going to show you some verses, I hope, but the concept is, is very standard is Jesus Christ is going to come back so at some point in the future. No matter what your eschatology is, Jesus Christ is going to return. And at that point in time, there will be the evaluation. There will be the judgment. Uh, not in the negative judgment. Peter's not focusing here on the negative side of the judgment. He's not talking about those who are going to be you know, going into punishment but on those who are believers, and they will be rewarded. And it's going to result in praise, glory, and honor. And this, I'm going to show you some verses, I think. This praise, glory, and honor is going to go to the person, to the believer. It is praise, glory, and honor from Jesus Christ. It is Him recognizing you have done this. This is what Jesus said so many times. He had so many parables, so many illustrations, so many times he referred to it. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's not glory and honor to God. That's glory and honor and praise from God. Now let's go ahead and read this again. These have come so that your faith, you've got it today, but sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's not focused. Maybe you're trying to please this group. Maybe you're, you're trusting this. Maybe you've got these wrong ideas. It's a greater value than gold. That your faith may be proved, tested and proven genuine. And if we can do that, it will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When Jesus Christ reveals himself, one of the things that takes place at that revelation, at the coming of Jesus Christ, is his rewarding of the people. So let's go ahead and look in, in a... Oh, yeah, let's go ahead. I've got several things written down there on, in the middle of page 2. Uh, this explains verse... Verse 7 explains why these trials are allowed to come. It says that they test to refine and prove your faith is genuine. If it's not genuine, again, if you're, if, you're, if you're a believer and you're being addressed by Peter, you have faith in Jesus Christ. You are a believer. You're, you understand? This is kind of slippery right here. Because sometimes we talk, you've got to have faith to be saved. Okay, do these people, are these people saved? Well, yeah, they've got an inheritance kept in heaven for them. They're guarded by God's power. They're locked in. They're in the plan of God. So do they have faith? Yes. But that, if we can say it this way, that's salvation faith. That's faith in the, the message of the gospel. But there's a growing faith, a growing understanding. And it's going to end up talking about, oh, here in a little bit, we're talking about, yeah, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. It's talking about your relationship with God, uh, with Jesus Christ. Even though 
And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So it's talking there about knowing Jesus Christ, of loving Jesus Christ. And just in passing, that's a good little verse to flip to because in the Old Testament, people were to love and, and, and trust to seek Yahweh. Well, now Peter's saying they are to love and seek and honor Jesus in the same way. And so it is another verse right here that takes Jesus Christ and puts him in the, in the place of God. I know that's just a side note right here. But if, if Jesus wasn't God, this would have a, a different reference here. But Jesus is referred to here as God because he's being referred to as being the object of love. Um, but going back to the, the notes in the middle of the page, um, when it talks about genuine faith, you know that way I talk about here, the little steps right here. Uh, I've got these right, right here. One of the things Paul was concerned about, I don't think, well, maybe turn to two of these, but there's five things I wrote down. There's many others you could probably find. These are just things I just found quickly. But 2 Corinthians 10, verse 18, For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Now notice in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, it's the 1, 2, 3, 4th verse down. And notice I've got it quoted right there. And notice what the word approved is and the word test. Let me read this one. I'm going to go, we're going to go to this and look at this in just a moment. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God. That word approved there is dokimazo. Paul says we are speaking as men who have gone through the examination. We have been tested. And was Paul tested? By the time he writes 1 Thessalonians, that's early in, you know, in the New Testament letters. But he had gone through enough tests and trials to have proven it's like, no, I'm not here for the, the, the fans. I'm not here to please people because if I was still trying to please people, I'd still be in Jerusalem. I'd be up on the Temple Mount teaching. I'd still be rubbing shoulders with the rabbis and the high priest. But the very fact that I'm here in Thessalonica talking to you, writing you a letter from Corinth means, yeah, no, I've been tested. I've been approved by God. And that's what it is right here. We, on the contrary, we speak as men approved or dokimazwed by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men. This is what I'm shooting for right here. This is the phrase I want. We are not trying to please men, but God who, there's the word again, tests our hearts, doki mazos our hearts. He, Paul was very concerned and very aware of who he was pleasing. And, and we're going to go to that verse in just a moment. But let's go to second at the top of the page, top of the list, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, you can go ahead and surround yourself with all kinds of reasons why God will approve you, all these recommendations and all these stories and stuff, but it's not, it's not the one who can, who can give the best you know, interview who gets past the doki mazo, but the one whom the Lord commands. It's not how well you can sell yourself. It's not how well you can do at the interview. It's how well the Lord can present you. So at the, you know, kind of like this, we've all had interviews before. And, you, you know, sometimes people rise up in interviews and, and there's a place of being too boastful and crossing a line and being too arrogant. But there's also a place where you've got to sell yourself. You've got to, you've got to lay it out there. But you're selling yourself to people. You're, you're trying to present yourself. This verse is referring to the concept that at that time, the what that's going to matter is not how well you, the Lord says, well, how did things go? Well, here's what I did, Lord. And you present, you know, a slideshow and a portfolio of all the things you accomplished for the Lord. No, it's not the one who can commend themselves or dokimazo themselves. On that day, the Lord is going to say, let me tell you what you did. And the Lord is going to go through the list. Remember that, that out of what, Matthew 25? You know, uh, you, you saw me here, you did this for me. He says, uh, these are the ones uh, that were commended. But they'll be commended by the Lord. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. I am, not am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul said, well, let me tell you this. If I was trying to make men happy, if I was trying to find something that would sell, well, and that, the issue there is circumcision and, and, and different things. And Paul says, there's a whole group over here preaching circumcision. If, if I wanted to please men, I would go over there and I'd preach what was already selling. But he says, that's not, that's not the point. I'm teaching what Jesus Christ has sent me to teach. And it's not going to please men. It's going to be contrary to their direction. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So we make it our goal, Paul writes the Corinthians, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. And now I'd like to go, if you don't mind, please go to, go to 1 Thessalonians. And I want to read this verse in the context. I want to read these next two verses. 
Um, it's just kind of interesting, again, we're talking about the genuineness of faith, and Paul was very much aware of what was genuine faith on his part and what would be the indication that he didn't have genuine faith. That he was, he was, having, he was acting like he had faith, but he was doing something that would please men or some other motivation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Oh, I'm going to go, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to go to verse 3. Chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 3. Paul says, For our appeal, or his presentation, uh, we, the, for the appeal we make does not spring from error, that would mean doctrinal error, misunderstanding, or impure motives, meaning there's an underlying reason, like a traveling a philosopher or speaker would come through and collect money and then trying to get himself a group or a mailing list back in, in this day. We does not spring from doctrinal error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. There's nothing, there's, I'm not a, a bait and switch. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. Again, that switch of bait. I'm here for the people, but really I'm here for the people's offering. Or use flattery. Well, people that are happy, they think good things. You say good things to people, they'll say good things about you. You know, going both ways. He said, we're, we're not using flattery. We're not trying to gain money. Uh, God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. He says, I did not come to Thessalonica to follow, have a bunch of followers. Okay. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy, and this is also kind of on the same line, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'll go, go ahead, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And Paul, his last letter, he's in prison, he's now in the dungeon. He'll, he's, you know, weeks, days from being, being decapitated. 67 AD, he's writing Timothy, who's in Ephesus. And he's giving him his final instructions as, as Timothy is kind of leading the church. And he's himself, Timothy is now over people sending him out into ministry and, and, and you know, kind of keeping everybody on track. Verse 14 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Doki Mons, he says, he says, listen, people are going to get you distracted. They're going to want to argue about different words. They're going to want to argue about different details of things that have nothing to do with the message. Remind them of the discipline that we've established. Avoid conflict with words that don't matter. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now notice, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. What's a workman that does not need to be ashamed? If you send someone to do a job, and then they come back and they say, yeah, I did it, but either they didn't do it, they're just there to try to get some money, they did a shoddy job. Timothy has been a man who's been, a, a workman who's been assigned a job. He's going to pour some concrete, or he's, he's going to do this other, whatever the job would be. In his case, he's going to oversee the church and teach in the church. And... He does not want him to be ashamed. So do your job. The other thing, and who correctly handles the word of truth. And you know what this means. Uh, handles the word of truth. Correctly handles means to cut it straight. And we've talked about this before. That's a word from, from a, a butcher, someone who cuts meat. Cut the, you know, don't just chop the, you know, the meat up and, you know, oh, here it is, just some, you know, chopped up meat. Cut so you get the right portions. These are the steaks. These are the ribeye. These are, cut it so people know what it is. There's a right way to cut a turkey, and there's a wrong way just to mash it up and grind it up. And some people with the Word of God, they just mat, they just grind it up. It's like, what is that? Was turkey? It's like, there's a right way to carve a turkey. So he says, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the Word of truth. And then he goes on and says, avoid godless chatter. Now, again, this godless chatter is, is what would be replacing the correctly handling the Word of truth. It would be replacing the workman who, who is not ashamed. The person that the good workman who correctly handles the word of God would not be replacing the word of truth with godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And instead, people aren't going to teach and suffer through this phase of the ministry. All they're going to have left is what? 
godless chatter, which where do people go with that? They become more and more ungodly. They're, notice we're still talking about teaching, verse 17. Their teaching will spread like gangrene, meaning it just starts destroying parts of the body, eating away at the body because they're not teaching truth, they're teaching idle chatter, just keeping people entertained. And he's tell, this is the last thing Paul's telling Timothy. Their teaching will spread like gangrene among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered from the truth. They're still teaching, but they're not teaching the word of God. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. And that ties back into Corinth, where Paul had to write Corinthians chapter 15 and talk about the resurrection from the dead is going to be a literal, physical resurrection out of the ground. And they say, no, 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 the resurrection's already taken place. It's, it's in our hearts. It's a, this newness of life. And then they bring in Greek philosophy, and that's where Corinth was going, and Paul is trying to rescue Corinth from it, and now Ephesus is being overrun with that. Anyway, those are things right here. What I'm showing you is this, this, these things. These are the trials and one of the, that, that come to test our faith. And the faith that people have sometimes is not true faith. It's, it's got to go through these tests, and people will fail the test, and they'll just resort back to something else, and Paul was aware of his own life of being approved by God or approved by men. And there's a clear contrast. If you're going to stay over here, you may be approved by men, but to go over to this place over here where you're going to be dokimazo, approved by God, uh, it, it's, and result in praise, glory, and honor, it's going to end up walking away from some of these things that are going to be more popular among men. Let's go to page three at the top. We're talking about praise, glory, and honor. Um, and these are some examples. I, I won't go through all of them in the text of Scripture, but I, I think you'll be able to refer to these things. In Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, it'd be fun to read through that, but you, you know the context there, where Jesus says at the end, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Romans 2, 29 says, A man who's serving God and living a righteous life, he says, Such a man's praise is from God, not from men. So again, the concept that there will be praise, glory, and honor for those who, who pass these tests of dokimazo, and in the end, their, their faith is in the, the truth of God. They're be, they've been conformed into the image of the Son of God. There will be praise, glory, and honor, and here, is, here it is in Romans 2.29, such a man's praise is from God, not from men. Meaning, there will be people over here being praised by God for having genuine faith of being conformed into the image of the Son of God. And men will say, uh, yeah, we didn't even recognize that. We, we didn't even, what? Who? And there will be people over here that are recognized by men that God says, yeah, no, we're not going to give you your certificate. You weren't even close. You, you put on a show. You, put, you were a fraud. You put on a mask. You, you use flattery. Sure, everybody's going to say you passed. But you did you didn't you didn't dokimazo the approval that he was looking for. Uh, and you notice the contrast. The contrast so often is man's approval, God's approval. First Corinthians four five. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Matthew twenty five twenty one. Faithful with few things will be put in charge of many things. You know that verse. In Matthew twenty five thirty four, take possession of the inheritance prepared for you from the beginning. So you've gone through this. Welcome. Take take possession of that inheritance I've had prepared for you from the beginning. Now, I do want to go to Daniel chapter twelve because I just really like this verse, and whenever I get a chance to point this verse out, I like to point it out. Go ahead. Well, I think you've got. You're going to have a combination. You're going to have a. You're going to have some people that are not saved. They never. They don't have what we'd say saving faith. They they never entered into salvation. And then you're going to have. I think it's it's pretty clear that you're going to have people on on the spectrum here that they're saved, but they they didn't grow. They didn't mature. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna pass. Well, uh, we could go to First Corinthians. And read there about they'll pass through the fire, but they, their lives were wood, hay, and straw. They, they were built things that were important here in, in the temporal world, wood, hay, and straw, building materials. But when it passes through the dokimazo fire, there's nothing left. It says they'll be saved because the foundation was Jesus. They were saved because of Jesus Christ, but they didn't. They, they lost their reward. There'll be no. There'll be no reward for them. So yeah, I, I think we're talking about, sometimes we're talking about people that aren't even saved. We're talking about people that don't mature and don't accomplish things. But then we're talking about those who at the end are said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that is the reason we're even addressing this. 
is that is what Peter's saying. These tests and trials come, and, and Peter's actually telling them, aren't you glad you've got tests and trials? Because if you had no tests or trials, you would, you, you would, never, you would never, be, uh, re, never be evaluated. You'd never have to go back and refine your faith. You'd just think, well, I've got it. Everything's fine. You'd never have to ask any questions. And you, you'd always end up here. There would be no, basically, there'd be no growth. But because of tests and trials, that faith, you've got faith, but it's going to be purified and taken from just saving faith through a series of growth until it becomes, you know, from faith to faith, grace to grace, you continue to proceed. Uh, and Paul says about him, his own self, he says, not that I've already obtained all this, but he says, I press on. Notice what he says, I press on. This is out of uh, Philippians. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Christ Jesus took hold of Paul over here to put him over here as the servant doing the things he's called to. He says, not that I've already obtained all this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This is the goal. Paul was saved, but he says, and he's not worried about losing his salvation, but he says, I'm not done. Now, the, like we talked about, maybe I didn't refer to it last week. The same Paul who says, not that I have already obtained all this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In 2 Timothy says, I have fought the fight, I've finished, kept the faith, I've finished the race. So if you're going to believe him when he says, not that I've already obtained all this, but I press on to take hold of that, there is a time in 67 AD he says, well, I made it. I, I finished the race. I've, I've kept the faith, and now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness. He said, I can't wait for Judgment Day for the Doki Mods because I'm going to do it. Now, that's the same man who was very concerned about saying, no, I'm not pleasing these people. I, I know who I'm trying to please. Now that he didn't make mistakes, but he, there's a time in his life he says, I'm not there yet, I'm still working. But there's a time in his life where he says, I know I've made it, which is kind of interesting. I mean, you're not always in that fog. I'm not sure if I'm following Jesus Christ or not. Well, you go through some of those tests Paul does. I mean, you've been beaten five times. You've been shipwrecked three times. You've got people betraying you from the, your brothers to your, the Christians to the heathen, and you're still doing what? You're still preaching. You're still living the life for Jesus Christ. It's kind of like, there's only one way you'd st still be living the life for Jesus Christ. You've got to have faith. You've got to understand. You've got to have, again, faith is not that mystical, magical, I just believe in fairies or something. Faith is a confidence that I know who I am following. And I'm not following these men that have betrayed me. I'm not going to quit because I got beaten with some rods. If I, they beat me and kill me, it's over. If they beat me and I get up, I go back to preaching because this is my target. I, I, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of encouraging. Uh, I want to I look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, please. Daniel chapter 12, looking in verse 10. And again, there's, there's chapter 11 and chapter 12. There's so much to go through to get to this verse. But I, I think I've got some things written down right here. Uh, yeah, I've got on top of page three, I believe it is, in italics, and I've got the words, kind of the meaning of the word in bold. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Oh, of course, I'm going to begin in verse 8. Again, if you struggle with the book of Daniel, uh, don't worry, so did Daniel. If you understand the whole book of Daniel perfectly well, then maybe you need to go back and read it again. Because when Daniel chapter 12, verse Chapter 12, verse 8, Daniel says, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Those are some terrible things you've said. It's, that's so confusing. I, I don't even know what you were talking about. He says, can you just tell me what the outcome will be? How, how's it all end? I mean, I think the ending is within there. You should be able to find the ending. But, but Daniel says, how does this even end? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. He says, go your way, Daniel. It's, it's all, I just need you to know this, Daniel. It'll all kind of become the place. It'll all be kind of revealed as it goes. Just, you've done your job. You've heard it. Now just go write it down. Things will take care of itself. And then he sums it up. This is what's going to take place between Daniel's day until the end. Here's what is taking place from the day of Daniel's prophecy until now and until Jesus Christ returns. Many will be purified made spotless and refined. But the wicked, they'll continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. In other words, these men who are wicked, 
They will continue to be wicked. You can't move them. They, they don't know anything. They, they've rejected truth. They will only continue to be wicked. But those who are wise will understand. And notice these words, many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. I've got just a, just a general definition. Purified, the word means examined. Dokimadzo. Many will be examined. Many will be tested. Made spotless. That means cleansed. In, in the middle school, we call that retested. They failed the test. And now there's this, again, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not making an educational statement here. I'll, I, I will support that. You can argue both sides of it. But if a child fails a test, say it's in English or in history or math, back in the day, they got an F. Now, again, I, I, this is not an educational statement. They got an F. Sorry, your child's failing. Next child. Now, if your child gets an F, I think it's almost more, there's a weakness to it also, but it's more, it's more dokimazo. It's more biblical. Right, you failed. Now we know where you're at. So, before they can retest, there has to be reteaching. Now, you don't want to hear that as a teacher. What? Reteach. I've already covered the material. Right, but they didn't get it. Well, I gave them an F. Right. They deserved an F. They didn't get the material. But you're the teacher. What, well, how, when am I going to do that? Well, figure it out. I mean, there's, there's plenty of support for this whole idea. They have to be what? Retaught. And then retested. And maybe they, and of course, you know, they don't have to get an A+, plus, but they, do, they can't get an F. And so that's that next part right here cleansed or made spotless. Many will be purified. They will be examined. And then what's going to happen? They're going to be retaught and cleansed. They're going to be repaired. We're going to teach them again. And notice this last word, refined. It means fused or cast. Meaning many will be tested. Many will fail. They'll be retested. They'll be cleansed. They'll be purified. And then what's going to happen? They're going to be cast into their eternal image. And some will shine as bright as the stars, star different from star in glory, but that will be their, we're preparing people for eternity. So they're going to be dokimadzo, they're going to be cleansed, they're going to be fused or cast into that image. Does that make sense to you? So when we fail a test, God in His grace brings us back and is going to teach us. Now if you don't show up for the retesting or the reteaching, if you're going to be disobedient, that's another whole issue. But if you are pursuing this, and as Paul was, he was concerned about his faith. And he went through many tests. And his tests, uh, maybe the reason I don't suffer as much as Paul does, maybe I'm doing better in class. Maybe I'm just doing better in class than Paul was. And Paul kept failing, and he had to go through extensive retesting. Me, I just get it the first time. I'm just smarter spiritually. Do you think that's the case? I know. I'm just trying to be funny right there. Okay. I'm getting scared. No one laughed. Okay. We are at about time to quit. Um... I think that's a good place to quit. Let's go back to 1 Peter. Yes, sir. Matthew 7, 21. Matthew what? Ah, uh, right. Matthew 7, 21. Um, I'm looking at it right here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now again, does the will of my Father, that can become very legalistic very quickly. What does that mean? I think this is the will of the Father. If you go to Romans chapter 1, to obey the gospel, what is obedience to the gospel? The, from the starting block, what is obedience to the gospel? Is to hear and believe. That, I mean, that, that's how it starts. I mean, like, what do I need to do to be saved? Believe in Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Here is the God. What's the first work of faith? Jesus explains, what is the work? The people say, what, what is the work that we must do? Jesus answers, he says, believe. Believe in the one he sent. Because if you will believe in the one he sent, you are on track. You, you, you've done the work. The work is to have faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, what does obey, obey the gospel mean? You hear the truth, you obey it by believing it. Disobedience, rebellion to the truth is what? How, how can you be rebellious to the truth? 
You say it's a lie. You disobey. You, or you disobey it by saying, I don't believe it. So now, if you believe, God is now working, you're on that fast track. Things are pro pro progressing. So let's go back and read this again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? Again, we, this, uh, I'm rushing through this. That should be discussed more than just what I'm saying. But I can say the will of the Father is answered in the book of John when they're asked, what is God's will? To believe in the one he sent. And again, we can come out of that in many different directions. It's not, well, what do I do? Do good works. Do good. Do it's like, believe, and he will get you on this track, and he'll start testing that faith, that broad, general faith. He's going to start refining it, and he'll prepare you for where he's going. Now, when it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, this right here, this system, is the eternal message. This, this whole plan, this, this is the eternal God. This is truth. This will transform lives. It'll transform nations. It'll reroute history. There's power here. And people will recognize that. Whenever you can get people together, there's power there. And whenever there's people and there's power, there's fakes. That was, there's people that are going to step in and go, yes, wow. And they're going to come in, like Paul says, with impure motives. They're going to come in with a, 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 a mask on to cover up their greed. Or they're going to cover up some other motives. Or they're going to come in with some different teaching. They're going to start here and they're going to mislead you over to their way. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes because they never learned anything. Some people are stepping into pulpits, leading churches, and they know they've got to hand out flattery. They've got to please the people somehow. So how can you please the people? Oh, uh, give me your, what, are you, what kind of problems do you have? You see, again, I'm going to say something. I'm going to go off topic here for just a moment as if I'm not already. I'm not interested in your problems. I'm not interested in, in a mega church and all that. We've got to solve all these problems. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's another whole type of ministry. I see the Word of God as, as something people need to hear. I'm more concerned about what God wants me to do than what people want me to do. Well, the people want this. I could care less what people want. I'm, I'm afraid of this circle. I'm not afraid of your circle. Well, we just don't think Galen's very nice. We don't think Galen's very... He doesn't say nice things to us. I've ne I'm not even concerned. I'm more concerned about what my middle school kids think of me because I've got to work with them every day. I don't care what people in West Des Moines think of me. Why would I care? Well, it, you know, it's like what I'm worried about is this circle. Someday I'm going to stand in front of you. He's not going to be concerned about my gold. He's not going to be concerned about my friends on Facebook. He's not even going to be concerned about how many wood projects. He's, he, what he's going to say, how's your faith? Has your faith developed? It's more valuable than gold. This is what I'm concerned about. Now, who are these people? Lord, Lord. Those are people who didn't think that way. They were concerned about being in people's circles. It's like, what do you think of me? And they're going to, like, look at all this. It's like, they go, well, look what we did. We did all these things. So I never even knew you. You, were never even, you weren't even concerned about the circle at the end. You were more concerned about all these other things. He said, get, a, get away from me. You, weren't, you didn't ever obey me. You didn't know me. You weren't concerned about me. Don't call me Lord. You used the name Lord. That's that what I think. I think that's what that means. I might be wrong. <laughs> Hey, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to be done. Thank you very much. We will actually proceed further next week in 1 Peter. Thank you. I do. But as far as people, I am so thrilled you are here, though. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you very much for being here. That's all you're going to get. Okay. So. Father, we thank you so much for the good things you've done for us. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And we do ask that we may continue to grow, that we would produce the fruit of the Spirit, that we would, would honor you as, as far as our lifestyle and the things that we do. And we do thank you again for your faithfulness to us and the plans you have for us. We ask that we would take it seriously and that we would grow to become the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you once again.